Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to an edition of Summit Online ASEAN Recap. It's exactly, well, about one and a half minute past 10 a.m. here in Singapore, and I'm speaking live to you. Yes, this is a live keynote coming across streamed from one of our studios in the Singapore office. It was raining a bit this morning. The weather's actually pretty nice. I made it on time. And so the other thing that we're going to do today is we're going to have a series of breakout sessions, 29 different breakout sessions and tracks. And for the first time, we're going to have many of them in localization, local languages. So Vietnamese, Thai, and Bahasa. And so watch out for more updates towards the end of this keynote. Now, by way of introduction, my name is Shantanu Dutt. I am the head of technology for Southeast Asia here in ASEAN, based out of Singapore. I've had the privilege of being in the company for nine and a half years. And really one of the best parts of my day job is meeting customers like you and understanding what use cases that you're working on, how can AWS help solve your technology problems through innovation and inventing on behalf of you. That's really one of my favorite parts of my day jobs. My Twitter handle is here. Uh, and so if you'd like to connect with me, have some comments, clarifications on my keynote, apart from putting in questions to our staff who's monitoring your questions, so users who are registered on the main platform can post your questions there throughout this keynote and I'll take live questions towards the end. Over and above that, if you want to connect with me, my Twitter handle is up there as well. Now, the theme for my keynote today is constant transformation is the new normal. Why is that? Well, we think that we have reached a stage in the industry where there's transformation and innovation happening every single day, not just in one or two or three industries. It is across different industries, traditional bricks and mortars, as well as new mainstream commercial or even otherwise. And the other, the other thing is these are happening in spaces in different technology domains, which are across you know, networking, containers, DevOps, analytics, machine learning, IoT, uh, <coughs> bricks and mortars, systems, and enterprise applications, and so on and so forth. So it's not restricted to a particular set of technologies or industries. And more excitingly, we're going to also see a couple of live demos towards the end of my presentation. Yes, those demos will be absolutely live in our studios. Uh, hopefully, the demo gods are good to us because there's no scope for glitches because this is literally live. Now at Amazon, we consider ourselves as a day one company. And day one to us is really literally day one, which is in spite of Amazon.com being in existence for 25 plus years, and with AWS, we have been in existence offering public services on the cloud for 14 and a half years, we consider ourselves a day one company, which is in spite of all the customers and the use cases and millions and millions of you know, customers running on a platform, we still believe it's very, very, very early days for us in this journey to see what's even possible in its entirety with our customers running on a platform. And that day one culture internally within the company gives our staff and employees the urgency to actually constantly transform every single day. Now, there are industries and technology working in the back end that are working in ways inventing on behalf of you, which you sometimes may not even realize. Talking about Amazon.com itself. Now, hundreds and thousands of you out there watching this live stream, I'm sure have shopped from Amazon.com at some point. Some of you probably are regular shoppers from there, including me. Now, at the core of packages being delivered to you on time and all that magic happening in the back end, there's a core supply chain you know, madness that happens. And the core of it is huge warehouses or also called as fulfillment centers. <coughs> And our fulfillment centers, a typical nine generation fulfillment center, could have lots and lots of conveyor belts that you see here, winding down, roundabout, up to down, straight, carrying all these packages, and automating our supply chain within the fulfillment center. And an average fulfillment center, a large fulfillment center, can you guess as to how long the conveyor belts are, all of the conveyor belts combined? It's 14 miles. That's 14 miles worth of conveyor belts in an average eight or nine generation fulfillment center in a large facility in US or some other marketplaces. Now you can imagine at that scale, we can't afford to things breaking down because we don't want our customers being disrupted by packages reaching them late. And so what we do is we use a lot of AWS tech in the background. There's IoT, there's AWS Greengrass monitoring the health of these conveyor belts proactively and looking at the wear and tear. And then before they even are about to break down, there's a problem, they actually trigger 
using AWS Lambda functions and staff functions, a series of workflows, which in turn sort of give signals to our staff, which then work with our vendors and fulfillment center conveyable suppliers to actually come and replace faulty parts even before they become faulty or before the wear and tear is you know, completely leading to a breakdown. And so at this massive scale, automation does matter. Continuing on the e-commerce and retail space, one of the challenges with uh, you know, delivering and fulfilling packages in the back end is logistics. Have you imagined as to how non-trivial logistics is because at every minute there's a package being delivered and tracking all of that can be a challenge. And so Parcel Perform, which is a Singapore-based parcel tracking software as a solution service, basically does exactly that. It integrates with 600 global carriers and counting and gives really an easy to way understand email or SMS updates to customers. And so e-commerce agents or merchants can leverage this one-stop shop platform to actually not bother about the undifferentiated heavy lifting of integrating themselves with different providers. Even in Singapore, which is, as you can imagine, not a huge country in terms of size, there are about 10 up to 10 different carriers that can be used for deliveries from DHL to Singapore Post and more. And each of these carriers have a different backend, a different API integration point. And if each merchant were to individually integrate with each of these carriers, that would be really complex. It's a lot of overhead. And Parcel Perform exactly does that for you. Now, Parcel Perform was born on AWS. They started off with using our infrastructure services like AWS, Amazon EC2, relational database service, and as they scaled to get in more efficiency in their backend, they went to a container-based microservices architecture on AWS. Today, Parcel Perform basically handles hundreds of millions of updates, and updates in their world is basically updates on tracking packages. Now, according to the CEO, Dr. Arn, Say, Dr. An says that up to 50%, that is half of all incoming queries to e-commerce agents and merchants are basically related to where's my package? I've delivered my package, I'm going to track it. And so 50% of customers actually call in to call centers or on the chatbots or incoming queries on tracking their packages. Imagine if Parcel Perform takes away that overhead, that's freeing up your call center or contact center agents and customer service agents by 50%. And then they can actually focus on higher value tasks. Moving on from e-commerce and retail to electricity, you know, uh, energy. Now, Electrify Asia is one of the startups specializing in the distribution of renewable energy. And so they're decentralizing the distribution of renewable energy, which has deregulated the power sector in Singapore. Using AWS, they built a marketplace which had a lot of electric electricity retail plants and they built a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform online called a Synergy. With the goal of actually creating 1 million users, they've already exceeded the, that goal because they could scale on the AWS platform easily. And what it has done is for electricity consumers like us in Singapore, it has made plans very, very transparent and we can choose the best consumer plans using a one-stop platform. And so really, as you can see, a lot of people think energy and electricity, a lot of people don't think about you know, back-end logistics, but the innovation happening in these sectors and these domains is just enormous. Sometimes you don't even realize with the use of AWS tech that's happening, driving, which is a driving force in powering this innovation. Let's look at our infrastructure. What's happening with our global infrastructure? Well, we continue to actually expand our global infrastructure. We, as of today, have 24 different regions in different parts of the world covering most continents. And coming with those regions are 77 availability zones. When I joined the company, we had about five regions and about going to the sixth region, about 12 to 15 availability zones. And it's amazing to see a growth to 77 availability zones just like that over the years. There's obviously other form of infrastructure in CloudFront Pops for caching or direct connect locations, which is almost 100 that we have reached. And most of these regions now are interconnected. Now, on this global infrastructure is powered 175 plus services from the AWS platform that customers like you consume every day. And on the basic units, one of the baseline services that we have been providing for the last nearly 14 years is our compute offering or Elastic Compute Cloud or also called as EC2. And customers who have used and leveraged the power of EC2 would know this, that we don't just give you a virtual machine or a bare metal instance just like that. 
it is not just a compute instance, but a lot of heavy lifting and innovation that goes behind the scenes to actually modify those instances, custom made for you, so they are optimized from our viewpoint of security, high availability, cost optimization, and performance. For years, we have worked with chipset providers like Intel and AMD very closely to actually ensure our instances are customized for the best performance and cost efficiency. And recently, in the last couple of years, we've added a third option to give our customers the flexibility and the choice, and that is ARM processors. And a customized version of the ARM processor that we have come up with is Graviton. A lot of people don't realize that AWS now is into the business of chipsets as well. Yes, with Graviton, you know, the first generation Graviton instances, which was the A1 instance types, were released uh, some years ago. And now with Graviton 2 instances, it's a leap change in performance uh, com compared to other x86 type of instances. For example, Graviton 2 instances can give you up to 40% price to performance improvement over comparable x86 instance types. And that's huge. A lot of customers have started onboarding this. If you're really interested in actually taking advantage of Graviton 2 instance types, which are, by the way, in general availability mode in the Singapore region as of last month, please get in touch with us. We would love to work with you, with our solutions architecture team and other tech teams to engage with you, to help you to the journey to transition to instance types with better price to performance. Graviton 2 instance types also support a wide variety of workloads from application servers to databases to open source to containers to high performance computing and more. So happy to see what customers do with our Graviton 2 instance types in this part of the world in Asia. Now let's look at what are the areas and trends in you know, services that we have been up to in the last few months or so. You know, when you move to the AWS cloud, this is what we tell customers, customers sometimes can tend to underrate the power of offloading undifferentiated heavy lifting, which is automating your OPEX costs, your operational overhead, which is being more productive. And I'm not just saying productive in terms of your applications, but also your developers and your employees and staff and et cetera, et cetera be it from search, be it writing code, or even other areas that we will look at. And so we have been working on building a platform with productivity related services to make our customers more efficient. We also then have computing at the edge, which is really a lot of innovation, apart from the global infrastructure, a lot of computing is happening at the edge. And I'm talking about remote offices, I'm talking about factory floors, healthcare centers, ships, smart cities. And so we've been working on getting more offerings of compute at the edge for our customers. And then lastly, we've been working on you know, cognitive services and fraud detection services uh, uh, with a lot of use cases uptaking in this space. And behind it all, the power of machine learning is driving the innovation behind some, behind some of these services. So we look at, in no single order, some of the updates for these services as well as some interesting and exciting customer use cases before we look at some live demos. Now talking about compute, instances and computing at the edge. Last year at reInvent, if you remember, we released the Outpost service and a lot of customers ask us, what's the point of Outpost? Well, a lot of customers who have very, very low millisecond, single digit millisecond latency applications that are sensitive to latencies and cannot afford to be running and doing the back and forth between the central region and their on-premise infrastructure needed a hybrid version of cloud, but they did not want to do the overhead and heavy lifting of purchasing hardware on their own and then managing them, customizing that, doing the operational piece of monitoring them, patching them, et cetera, et cetera. And so with Outpost, we actually ship to customers the same AWS infrastructure. It's not just a rack, but the same AWS infrastructure in EC2, EBS, or so compute and storage, and other services, so that they can, from the on-premise, be connected to the AWS cloud and have a single pane of glass view of the cloud infrastructure in a hybrid mode. And AWS Outpost, unlike other offerings, uh, uh, from competitors basically has this, you know, is managed and delivered by AWS and it uses APIs to manage the entire end-to-end -end operation. So you don't have to actually patch or install them. It's managed by AWS. You obviously manage your EC2 instances and your applications like you would do in the cloud. So it's almost seamlessly as if you have a single pane of glass between your on-premise and the cloud. As of today, AWS Outposts is available for order in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Thailand, and Indonesia, with some of the other ASEAN countries coming up on the roadmap in the near future. 
An extension to that is the concept of local zones. And before that, I would like to cover Philips Healthcare. Now, Philips Healthcare was one of the early customers of Outpost in the US. And Philips Healthcare has 70,000 plus servers that they were using up until this point across 1,200 different locations. And they have to process patient data really, really fast in a matter of seconds so that their clinicians can know what is the output of the patient data and what's the diagnosis immediately without waiting for more than a few seconds. And so they wanted to actually have a common single pane of glass of view uh, versus having 70,000 different servers across 1,200 locations. And with Outpost, that fit, fitted their use case perfectly because now they can have the same AWS technology that they've been used for years as a customer of AWS Public Cloud by also extending the public cloud into their on-premise healthcare centers with Outpost units. And as an extension to Outpost, we also announced local zones, which is an easy way of bringing a large AWS global region much closer to your on-premises data center without you having to have an infrastructure like Outpost inside your premises. So let's say, for example, in a city like Los Angeles, for example, in California, where we launched our first local zones, it basically brings compute, storage, and other AWS services much closer to customers in Los Angeles from US West 2 or our Oregon region because Los Angeles doesn't have an AWS region. And so local zones consider that like an availability zone, a multi-tenant infrastructure, which is the AWS cloud, with multiple customers accessing it locally, but in turn be connected via the local zone into the larger region, which is Oregon. Why did we choose Los Angeles? Well, there'll be many more regions to uh, local zones in other cities to come. But one of the factors that drove us was the demand from Hollywood studios. So there are a lot of artists, you know, local artists or otherwise animation studios and rendering studios in Los Angeles as an extension of Hollywood, which basically need very low latency compute and storage for their render workloads and production houses. And then obviously go and store those assets in the Oregon region. Now you might be wondering, all the compute at the edge is happening by outpost and local zones. What if we want to actually ship hundreds and terabytes of data into the cloud and hit, you know, transferring it over the wire, over the internet may not work because it might take weeks or months. What happened to the snowball series of devices? Well, the answer is those absolutely continue. And if anything, there are lots and lots of customers uptaking new types of use cases using our snowball family. And it's become an entire family because it's become an entire series because there are other, you know, iterations to the entire Snowball family. The first version, which was Snowball, and subsequently Snowball Edge, which also introduces compute, continue to have 100 terabytes of storage for customers that want to order a Snowball device, you know, transfer 100 terabytes of data, and then ship it to the AWS cloud. And then if you're a company that has petabyte scale, that is hundreds of petabytes or he hexabyte scale storage requirements, and you want to move that to the AWS cloud, we obviously have the Snow Mobile version of things, which is literally a truck with a container that's capable of storing 100 petabytes of data. And the way it works is there's a truck that gets parked outside a data center and then you know connects with your data center with a long cable, transfers up to 100 petabytes of data that each container is capable of, and then goes back to the AWS region to copy your data back in an encrypted manner. And as usual, as we do with all family of services, we have been iterating here as well. And one of the latest iterations in this family is AWS Snowcone, which is a device which is, you know, you can hold it in your hand. It's 2.1 kilos, so not very heavy. It can store up to eight terabytes of data and it's got Wi-Fi connectivity. And so it can sit inside a data center, you can carry it along and sync it with other devices and storage devices and you can order multiple versions of them. It is not yet in general availability in Singapore. It is available in the US regions, but very soon is on a near roadmap to scale it out across other regions. Now that was about a bit of our infrastructure and computing at the edge and our snow series family. What about productivity that I spoke about earlier? You know, search, which is not a new concept, the concept of search as a domain has been existing in the industry for years, but a lot of our customers told us that we want to actually bring in the power of really good search into our internal and external digital assets and web properties. And so we announced in preview at last reInvent Amazon Kendra, which is a machine learning powered search service given to customers who can actually use the platform to power their front end search engines very, very easily. 
And you know, according to us, there are three kinds of search that most commonly most customers do. That is your end users, which is factoid search. So things like who was Walt Disney or when was Amazon founded? Who's the founder of Amazon? And so when you type those questions on a public search engine, have you noticed that before it gives you all the links on the top, it gives you the answer to your question in most cases. So it's very easy and intuitive for you to get the answer without having to go into a link and clicking it. And so imagine customers like you wanting that same functionality in your search engine in your public facing web property. And so Amazon Kendra can actually plug into your systems and do that for you. The second type of search could be more descriptive. How do I use or connect my Amazon Echo Dot device to my home network? So that's not a binary answer, but more of a procedural or descriptive answer. And that's another type of question that Amazon Kendra can power your search engine to do. And the third piece is really keyword search or questions that are a little more open-ended. If you have a new joiner joining a company who's new, rather than getting lost and searching around and asking for people, a simple query like where is the IT support desk could lead to you know, easy to find answers and it can make a very self-service culture within your organization. Now, when the intent or the scope of a search is not very clear, and then Amazon Kendra will switch from machine learning to going into deep learning to actually bring you a list of documents. And what's more is your end users could even use a feature like an upvote or a downvote button to maybe look at what's the accuracy of search and then Amazon Kendra will take that feedback to constantly iterate its machine learning models to give you better search outputs. The moving on to, you know, talking about internal and external digital web assets, talking about public web properties of yours, Amazon Sumerian can bring in that extra dimension to your mobile and web properties and websites and assets. And when I say extra dimension, I mean literally extra dimension, which is it can bring in 3D views. Let's say you're an e-commerce online store provider. Rather than having a flat 2D version of pictures of objects that you're selling to your consumers, you could easily using Amazon Sumerian add a 3D version of it, which is interactive, which makes it much more intuitive to the end user to sort of see the three sides or four sides of the object and you know be more sold on whatever you're selling. Imagine looking at a conference room or a training center, which is much more interactive and you're seeing a 3D view of that entire you know, a conference room for a future offsite with your staff, which makes you much, much more, you know, easy to understand the view and the layout of the hall versus looking at a blank 2D picture or a two-dimensional picture on a printout. For example, you know, Maxis in Malaysia, which is a household name, it's a telco and one of the communications provider companies and been a customer of AWS for a long time, they embarked on a digital transformation exercise a few years ago. And as a part of that last year, what they decided to do is bring the digitization inside their physical stores. And so one of the stores in downtown Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia was converted completely and transformed with digital screens and they brought in a lot of digital interactivity within the store so that customers could interact better. So there was a lot of AWS powering this, but one of the key things they also did in addition was add a Sumerian based 3D avatar on a screen on a pillar at the center of the store. And so the way it works is as a customer, you can walk in to the store in KL with your queries or issues or whatever that you visited the store for. And you can using a mobile phone, scan the QR code and get a token. And then this avatar in a friendly way will greet you, say bye to you, say hello, et cetera, et cetera. And becomes much more interactive without a physical staff needing to do that. In addition, in the near future, they also plan you know, to add scope of conversational interfaces so that when you scan your code with your registered mobile number, this avatar could potentially start talking to you about your problems, preempting why you've come to the store for, because they might know what your issues have been recently, what your calls have been about. And by the time the customer actually reaches to meet a physical customer service agent at a desk, maybe 70 to 80% of their issues or problems have been answered and the customer is much more engaged in the store versus just taking a physical token and getting bored store and potentially walking away. Union Bank in Philippines has done something similar, which is basically looking at, you know, a Sumerian based avatar, you know, interacting with their customers. It's amazing as to how, uh, you know, traditional industries like bank and telcos have gotten seamless digital interactivity inside physical stores or physical branches. 
Now, talking about that and talking about productivity, apart from AWS, our customers are also thinking about productivity in different ways, which is making their end users or whatever that they're providing to much more interactive. And talking about banks, we have VP Bank in Vietnam, which you know uh, started off their first ever digital bank as a standalone di division, and it was called as YOLO. And their senior execs decided to name it YOLO because it stands for You Only Live Once. And uh, the theme was around, you know, people in Vietnam, you know, have a lot of things to do in a day. Going to a bank branch in traffic and standing in a queue is not something you generally look forward to. You have to go to a bank and do transactions because you have to. And how about digitizing that? And so the YOLO is one of the first digital banks in Vietnam that was born on AWS. And using AWS, they could go to market in four months with this app. And otherwise, their CTO said it would have taken them up to 18 months uh, or more if they had used on-premise infrastructure. They have now reached a staggering 600,000 plus registered users since launch recently. And there are millions of transactions happening on their platform regularly without any downtime at all. And so clearly a win for Vietnam's first digital bank on the AWS cloud. Now moving on to machine learning. Now, for a long, long time, machine learning has been considered as a niche, something exciting. And we said that at one of our summits two years ago, that machine learning has become a new normal, simply because we are seeing customers across industries using machine learning in different ways, which are significantly adding efficiencies to their work and their outputs. And I have this hypothesis that machine learning and analytics you know, are going to become so pervasive and common that in future, they're even going to be stop calling machine learning and analytics because it's going to be assumed that if you're running an online business, you're going to have analytics and machine learning. No one's going to ask you whether there's machine learning or not. It's just going to be assumed. It's not too dissimilar from the late 90s when there was this term, remember, called as e-business. What is e-business today? Well, e-business is business. Everything that we do is online. And so that term doesn't exist anymore. Similarly, I have this hypothesis that maybe a few years from now, machine learning and analytics and all these terms will go away because it will just be so pervasive that people will assume that machine learning is in play. And for a long time, people have believed that the only use case of machine learning is really it's all about predictions. So again, if you have shopped from Amazon.com, you would believe that people who shop for this also bought this. And so that's called traditional statistical modeling techniques, which is based on a certain set of historic trends. You're going to do something else or something else is going to happen. And that is the main purpose of machine learning, using predictions. While that is to some extent true in the initial days, because predictions was one of the early traditional use cases of machine learning, Machine learning today is into a lot of different use cases across industries covering a lot of things. It's no longer just about predictions. Machine learning today is about automation. It's about computer vision. It's about natural language processing and voice. It's about gaming. It's about robotics. It's about forecasting and much, much more. This is not even an exhaustive list. And so don't get fooled to believing that, oh, it's machine learning and artificial intelligence. So predictions is what they do. There's a lot of areas that we go, we're going to subsequently in the next few minutes look at demos at and also look at different use cases that people are working on on the AWS cloud and machine learning. And a large portion of machine learning driven use cases are happening here on AWS cloud. For example, talking about Domino's Pizza, that has been an AWS customer for a long time. And for all of you pizza lovers out there, Domino's requires no introduction as a brand, including for, to me. Now, Domino's actually tells us that it estimates that 70% of all their end users, their customers, are basically online customers, right? So a lot of their transactions and orders come in online from the app or their web. And so getting their campaigns and you know, digital personalized recommendations right was very important to them. And so using Amazon services like Amazon Personalized and Amazon Point Point on the AWS platform, they were able to accurately increase their campaign uh, you know, outputs in terms of getting offers to their customers and making right recommendations to their customers based on their previous purchases. And they saw a really, really good upside in terms of how accurate an uptake of those customers was. Their sales increased. However, in addition to that, and here's where the fun use case comes in, is in some of their stores in Australia, they started a project called as Project 310. What was Project 310? Well, it was this idea of trying to bring pizzas early to customers, even earlier than what they were used to. And so 
what they did was they created machine learning models from Amazon SageMaker and they actually had certain stores where they ordered their staff on their screen saying, hey, can you actually put in this type of pizza, like a margarita pizza with extra cheese, even before a customer order has come in, with the confidence that there's a reasonable chance that a customer somewhere is going to order a margarita pizza with extra cheese, because that's what historically happens on a certain weekday at a certain time. This is sure chance that a couple of pizzas of margarita pizza with extra cheese will be ordered in a certain time slot. And so the staff put the pizza in the oven and then by the time an order comes in, the pizza is ready to be delivered. And this is not a pizza being baked and kept in a hot box becoming stale, waiting for a customer order, it's just in time. And so one particular store in Australia, soups, I think there was a slide that was given, one particular store in Australia basically achieved a five minute you know, delivery time across a week, consecutively seven days by doing this. And that's fascinating. So next time you're ordering a pizza, you should know that there's some machine learning model on the AWS cloud almost predicting that you're going to order that pizza. All right, so, you know, moving on to what I like to call as tech for good, which is use cases of machine learning into industries which are not necessarily mainstream commercial, from businesses to uh, industries to even individual you know, individuals uh, into homes, etc. For example, in the agriculture space, we all know that agriculture is you know, a main business in some parts of the world in Southeast Asia with vast agricultural lands in certain countries. You know, farmers across agricultural fields basically look at seeds and they have a certain texture and a feel and a look. And by looking at them, farmers can actually state whether a particular seed will give rise to a good crops or bad crops. And so what a startup has done is using computer vision and computer modeling of machine learning is able to predict by looking at pictures of seeds whether certain seeds will give rise to good crops and certain seeds which will give rise to bad crops with a certain confidence score and they can be discarded as well which basically makes farmers much more efficient and scalable because with vast agricultural lands Farmers can use technology to then discard the bad seeds and then can actually do the most strategic work of farming and having machine learning at their hands. Amazing Fables in Malaysia has been in the business of children's storytelling books, right? I love it. I've got a six-year-old at home and I know the more storybooks I buy for her, the better. But what Amazing Fables has done is transform this by giving also the version of audio and video books for children so children can be more engaged. So using Amazon Polly, they're doing text to lifelike speech conversion and the pronunciation they tell us based on customer feedback is remarkably accurate. And what they also want to do in the future is use machine learning and Amazon Polly for things like multilingual video editing, for public announcements, for helping the visually impaired children and more. And so imagine with every printed book now comes a video or an audio book with the AWS cloud in the background powering it. Now, as I mentioned, there are individual lives also being impacted in a very positive way using machine learning. And we don't have to go too far to know an inspiring story of one of our colleagues in Amazon in the US, who is a solutions architect, whose son had aut um, autism. And so a few years ago, what he did was to help his son who was detected with autism, created his home and introduced Amazon Lex, Amazon Polly and Amazon Echo and connected them in a way by writing a few lines of code where now instead of his parents coming to him and helping him do daily mundane tasks like brushing your teeth or going to the bathroom or it's, you know, telling him it's time to exercise or time to go to have food, you basically have a combination of Echo, Polly and Lex working in tandem to actually make prompts just like a human being would do, except that there's no human being and it actually worked. And if you're interested to know more, you can basically go and search on the web for the PolyXC project and you'll see the video and you'll understand. It's really inspiring. On similar lines, we had another individual story of one of our colleagues in Australia who was basically walking down the road, met you know, another pedestrian and bumped into another pedestrian and she tried to communicate with this person who was this pedestrian on the opposite side and it took her about two or three minutes to realize that unfortunately the person that she was trying to interact with was deaf and mute. And she tried to interact with him hard, this person was showing sign languages and unfortunately the communication did not go well for obvious reasons, right? And so she went back home and she got inspired by that idea and she thought in her mind, how can I actually solve this problem in the future using AWS and the power of technology and the power of machine learning? 
And so she and a couple of team members then worked on a project, and this is sort of shown in our summit as well as part of a science fair, where they invented a small working demo and prototype called as Sign and Speak. And so before I actually talk through what it means, why don't we actually show and see this in action in the form of a live demo? Yes, this will be a live demo from the studios, and so hopefully the demo gods are with us. At this point, I would like to welcome my colleague Ishan, who has walked into the other side of the studio. Ishan is going to remove his mask so you can see him properly. We are obviously following social distancing norms and protocols during COVID time. So let's bring up the sign and speak console, please. Hello, Ishan. So what this is doing is transcribing my voice to text on a screen which Ishan can see. Ishan is using sign language to communicate with me, so he is acting as a deaf and mute person for the purposes of this demo. Hopefully Ishan's sign language is being interpreted now on the AWS cloud. Hello. How are you? What are you doing today? This is being uploaded to the AWS cloud on an S3 bucket, triggering a Lambda function, and then a machine learning model is basically interpreting the sign language. Going to a restaurant. Great. What time? Okay, so far working seamlessly. At 20 hundred hours. Fantastic. See you at Cafe Iguana. <coughs> Goodbye. All right. Thank you. Ishan, so as you saw, what happened? What were we doing there? We were not playing any tricks. There was no spokes and mirrors. This was an actual demo. And so as you saw, I was basically speaking with Ishan, trying to communicate with a deaf and mute person, hypothetically. Transcribe was basically translating or transcribing my speech into text, which Ishan could see, who's in the next room of our studios in the Singapore office. And then, using a custom machine learning model, it was detecting the video of Ishan doing his sign language, uploading to the AWS cloud, making an inference request, and that was being translated into text for me to read. Which means, because I don't understand sign language, I could still seamlessly communicate with Ishan by looking at this chat window of sorts, and the communication was pretty seamless. In addition, what we did was just to make it super clear, we had Amazon Polly converting this text into lifelike speech with natural language processing. So I had the comfort and luxury of having both modes, seeing this on screen and then confirming from the you know, voice that was coming out whether I'm getting the sign language right. And this, as you can see, has a lot of scope. This was just Ishan, I think, was um, using the Australian sign language. There are different versions of the sign language and depending on how you train a machine learning model using SageMaker, there are various different sign languages that you can actually convert into text and speech and then have two people speak to this seamlessly. All right, thank you. So that was about the demo and, you know, just reiterating on the piece of tech for good. At AWS, we are trying to make in small ways, whatever we can, try and make an impact in a positive way to the environment, to people, to industries and to companies as a part of a theme of tech for good. And I'm absolutely convicted that Together, that is you guys and us can work together and use the power of technology and machine learning to really make this place, you know, our world a better place. All right, moving on. Now, the next type of theme of machine learning is computer vision. You know, computer vision, according to me, has just become so easy to implement for our customers because using services like Amazon recognition, 
computer vision has just become so easy it was considered to be a niche and something that's hard to implement in the past but now you just don't have to do any undifferentiated heavy lifting all that is powered by the cloud here at AWS using things like Amazon recognition for images pictures as well as videos and there are different industries again using computer vision in meaningful ways that are helping their businesses just not fun, for fun science projects but in really significant and meaningful ways for example, in South Korea, Seoul, we have a petrochemical company called as Kumo Petrochemical. And they're headquartered in South Korea, but it's a multinational company. And they basically solved a age-old problem of having their staff going to certain places of the factory, which was designated as danger zone. So you have to wear a helmet as a part of the protocol. And that's been that protocol has been existing in traditional industries and factories for years but instead of them keeping and policing them by keeping a staff or a security guard or a person to see whether people are complying they basically are using computer vision by using amazon recognition and a series of other workflows to train the model to recognize the face of their employees and so they know who is which person and then train the model to make it realize as to when, what does it look when a person is wearing a helmet and what does a picture look when a person is not wearing a helmet. And so as you can see as a fun example here, literally, if there's a person who stands before a zone, before entering the danger zone, we have to wear a helmet, and the person is not wearing a helmet, it will, using Amazon Polly, call out loud saying, David, please wear a helmet. And so now people, it's much more intuitive and people will obviously be wearing a helmet much more, you know, frequently without a human being actually policing them. Moving on to physical, so we looked at a couple of e-commerce stories at the beginning of this exercise or is beginning of this session, you know, talking about physical bricks and mortar retail stores, like a supermarket, for example. If you ask the owner or the, you know, operations leader of a physical brick and mortar supermarket, anyone will tell you that among the top problems, one of the challenges that they have is just-in-time shelf replenishment which is when consumers are going into a supermarket, removing things and shopping or keeping things back, how do you, in a much more scientific manner, manage to trigger an alert so that in just in time, people will replenish the self so that otherwise what happens is usually their admin staff goes around the different rows and shelves with a pencil and paper sometimes and then notes down, well, row number five, shelf number three is empty, so let's replenish them. And they have to do it every 20 minutes, half an hour. How can you do it much more intuitively, which is much more accurate? And so what we did, so we at AWS here uh, in ASEAN got involved with our prototyping team to build a very simple prototype. And that involved using a very simple camera, mounting it on a IoT device, used some AWS services in the background, and we used machine learning where we trained the machine learning model with pictures of empty and full shelves to create a heat map. And so now what you will have is this retailer can have the time series pictures of the machine learning model outputting these pictures where red as part of the heat map means a part of the shelf is empty and green means it's full. And so imagine this retailer now having an admin, instead of having admin staff in each of the stores, have a central officer who can basically trigger, looking at these pictures, alert to each store just in time for each specific row in each specific self to replenish those shelves when it's the right time versus doing it manually. The other outcome, the side outcome and benefit that we got from this is the retailer said, wow, you know what, this has capabilities to extend to other benefits, including analytics. Now, it's very difficult, not impossible, you can do it, but it's very difficult and cumbersome to do analytics in the traditional sense in a physical brick and mortar stores. It's easier to do it in an online store because you're dealing with software and logs, not so much in a physical bricks and mortar store. But by analyzing a time series set of pictures on AWS Cloud, you can now predict with a little bit of accuracy saying, you know what, on Tuesday afternoons or Tuesday mornings at 11 a.m., there's a particular row and shelf that gets always full. Uh, or it remains full or a particular shelf or a row that gets empty. Why is that? Is it a popular set of items that are in it that are moving on? Are there a particular set of customers in a particular age group that are walking the store? You can do a lot of analysis, permutation, combination as a result of it. Now, this concept is not very different from 
for how things work with computer vision in our Amazon fulfillment centers. Now, in the Amazon fulfillment centers, we al already saw a you know, theme of the scale with all the conveyor belts in one of my first slides at the start of this presentation. Now, the other thing that we do is use computer vision and machine learning in Amazon warehouses and fulfillment centers to the point when we have pickers, so staff working in the fulfillment centers that go about searching for your order when you place an order. Instead of doing that, we have machine learning enabled cameras which are trained to actually point out which object, the object that you've ordered as part of your shopping cart is placed where which means instead of trying to search manually and go through these thousands and thousands of racks, there's a small portion of the rack that gets lit up with light from the camera and the staff knows that, oh, aha, this order that's come to me as a part of my order management system from an end user is actually stored here. Same the other way around. When a set of shipments come to us from our sellers, right, where we have marketplaces, to keep the supplies inside it, it basically points out very, very accurately that this is the right place to keep your, uh, you know, object here because this is not full and this is the right shelf stored with other objects. And so using that, it just becomes super intuitive. Every few minutes saved for our fulfillment center staff is at scale of millions of orders being shipped across in a marketplace, lots and lots of minutes and hours saved together. Now, we looked at computer vision, we looked at tech for good before that. The last theme I would cover as a part of machine learning, which is equally popular as you know, computer vision, is voice. If you think about it, for 50, 70 years, all computing needs of all human beings have been served by two human senses, touch and sight. So you look at the mainframes, to PCs, to computers, to laptops, to you know this, you know, mobile phone here that I have, or wearables or tablets. Primarily, we have mostly used touch and sight for using compute. You know, using computing. Now, voice and hearing, which is the third and fourth sense of human beings, we believe will be used much more pervasively for computing needs. Because think about it it's much more easier for us to talk to an Alexa device or another thing to order something versus going to your cell phone, picking it up and browsing and doing something. Human beings just can be lazy. We will always take the path of least resistance to do something that is easy. And that's why voice is going to play a major role in all computing needs in the near future. And that's why it's so strategic. Now at AWS for many, many years, we've obviously been in this space for a long time. We have had customer use cases that have been there and now progressing and iterating to different innovative use cases from speech to text, to text to speech, to you know, uh, translating from one language to another, to a finished product like the Amazon Echo device, or the Lex, which basically powers the Echo device, is a brain, but now has been given to you as a service so that you can build your own chatbots over voice or even otherwise yourself. All these cognitive services have natural language processing capabilities and have machine learning powering them for building use cases, which obviously are popular for the reasons I just mentioned. More of all, we have obviously the intelligent contact center, which is Amazon Connect, which is made in general availability earlier this year in the Singapore region for our ASEAN customers. Now you might ask, what's the big deal about contact centers? Call centers, they have been in existence for many years. Yes, but the traditional call centers aren't, or traditional call center systems aren't that intuitive. With machine learning in play, Amazon Connect can make agents much more intuitive. The number one reason market research shows that people complain about bad customer service, or at least one of the among top reasons, is long hold times or long average call handling times by contact center agents when you call a bank or a telco or any other company. And so with the intelligent contact center, it makes it much more intuitive for call center agents because machine learning is at play in the, in the background, powering things to make it easier for the agents. Now, Globe Telecom, which is the largest telco in Philippines and has been a long-standing customer, they have been onboarding Amazon Connect for a long time and now they're 100% onboarded all their agents with Amazon Connect to the point where they have publicly mentioned that their average call handling time, so average handling time of call has reduced drastically and the number of reduction in voice calls has also improved by intelligent routing. Now, you might ask, what does it do exactly? What does it look like? How does using an intelligent Amazon machine learning powered Amazon contact center, which is Amazon Connect, help reduce average call time? What does that intuitive look, intuitiveness look like? What does the agent see? 
Well, for that, let's move to demo number two, which we're going to do live today, which is completely based end to end on voice. And hopefully again, this works because we are doing it live. So what I'll do is to start with, I will do a role play of a contact center. I will act like an agent receiving a call, but without talking, I'll see what comes up on the screen. And I would like to invite another colleague of mine, Greg, who's just walked in to the other side of the studio here to basically speak with me. And so let's see what Greg has to say. Basic Q. Hi, John. I've been a customer for two years now, and I just received the notice that the special pricing I got when I first signed up is about to expire in two weeks. I called yesterday and I spoke to Steve, but unfortunately, he wasn't very much help. I checked your competitor's website and they are offering better pricing. All right, so what did just happen? So Greg basically called me as a customer. He just made a normal phone call. What he's not realizing is me as an agent, I'm receiving the call sitting in a contact center or call center using Amazon Connect. And this was live. And so what's happened is with Greg is basically speaking. It's basically transcribing in real time. It's pretty seamless as you can see for me. And I'm seeing this. It's using machine learning to underline key phrases. So I can read the sentences as fast because the key phrases are underlined. So it's catching my attention. On the bottom of the screen, it's doing a translation to Chinese, Mandarin. And then on top, it's showing a live emoji, which is changing sentiment based on the customer sentiment by picking up keywords. In this case, obviously, you have a very unhappy Greg, who's my colleague, who's acting as a customer. And so you're seeing a red sign here, which means alert, and a bad customer emoji and bad customer experience, because clearly Greg isn't happy with our pricing. And on the right-hand side, you're basically seeing you know, our system digging into our database and bringing up loyalty offers and discounts and other schemes for this customer who's clearly not happy with our pricing. So as a call center agent, I am without, before I start speaking to the customer, even before I've raised a finger to action something, I have all this information intuitively working for me with the power of machine learning. And then I have all the information on my screen to address the customer query much, much better, thereby hopefully reducing the average handling time. Now let's take it further, let's make it fun. So let's maybe offer Greg a free pizza, right? By just calling an automated call center, uh, which is basically a Lex. I will act like that uh, you know, customer now, and I'll make a phone call from a mobile phone for real to an automated Lex bot. Let's see how that works. Hopefully you can hear this, I'm putting on speaker. Hi Sound, how new dad? Welcome to my pizza delivery hotline. We will deliver the pizza to the address, 23 Church Street, with the postal code, 049481. Select the pizza type of your choice. Margarita. What size pizza? Large. What kind of crust you like? Thin crust. Thank you for calling my pizza. We will deliver your order soon. All right, that was a leg spot chatting with me. And let's see what this has triggered in the other room. What we have done is something fun. We are going to transition the camera, please, to the other room where we will see, you know, a drone that we have picked up, which carries a small fake pizza. No one's controlling the drone, by the way. This has been triggered by an AWS Lambda function as a result of me calling. And that triggered a Lambda function, triggering a code with a set of coordinates for the drone to fly across our room, across the studio. Greg, who looks like he's put his mask back again now, since he's not speaking, plucking the pizza from the drone. That's awesome. And now, hopefully, I should also get a slick SMS message, which you may not be able to see because this is very small, but I've received an SMS text message from Amazon Simple Notification Service telling me, your margarita pizza has arrived, order number 1041, enjoy it. And in the background, there were a series of 11, 12 different AWS services in play. But here's the important thing. For, every, for the entire demo, the only input that triggered a series of things was human voice. There was no other manual control that was triggering it. It was only human voice, from Greg's voice to my voice. And so that's it for me for now. Hopefully that was fun. What I'll now do is, since we have a few minutes, take, as I promised earlier, take some live questions 
from the audience. So I have my colleague here sitting in the next door. Uh, so there are a couple of questions come in. The first one, we are eager to leverage the 40% price to performance advantages that Graviton2 instance types bring comparable to other x86 instance types. How do we get started? Are Graviton2 instance types available for use in the Singapore region? Well, absolutely. So Graviton2 instance types were launched in the Singapore region as of last month. It is live for our ASEAN customers who are using the Singapore region to use and live in a lot of other regions as well. If you want to leverage it, all you need to do is have some capabilities in-house or we can help you with that because it does require a bit of recompiling of your code and applications and workloads running on other instance types. We have repositories on GitHub to help you with that. And it's just a matter of a few hours to maybe a couple of days to plan and execute it. And there you go. You can basically have your recompiled code and applications running on Graviton2 instance types to get a much, much better, up to 40% better price to performance ratio for your view workloads running on Graviton2. The next question that's come up, what is the pricing model for AWS Outpost? Well, so that's a great question. So AWS Outpost, as you know, we deliver racks as you, you know, we ship them and it's managed and delivered by AWS. So the pricing model is that we charge you for, there are three year pricing available. So you pay for three years, you have three choices, pay all upfront, you can actually pay partial upfront, or you can have no upfront and pay on a monthly basis, but it's a committed price for three years. It starts from anywhere between $250,000 uh, for a development test type, you know, rack instance types coming with EC2 and EBS, and right goes up to production instances. All our details are available on our website. Also remember that uh, all this pricing includes the installation, configuration, management costs, and everything that you get with your normal EC2 in the cloud, and it's pretty seamless with the outpost services as well. So all that is included in the cost, you don't pay additional for it. Let's see. All right, so that's it. I guess there are a few questions coming in, but you know, we will probably end there in the interest of time. So hopefully this was useful. You know, the power of technology and machine learning and voice and computer vision and compute at the edge and productivity tools is available at your fingertips today with the AWS Cloud. There is no limit as to what you can innovate using these technologies, and we are absolutely there to help our customers and innovate on our behalf of our customers. If there is anything or any limits at all, it's just your imagination. And so with that, I will come to the end of my live keynote. Hopefully you have enjoyed it. Just as a reminder, we have lots of breakout tracks coming in another three minutes from now or two minutes from now at 11 a.m. Singapore time. So these are all new sessions. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we have a repeat of the earlier, you know, earlier in the year, we had a virtual summit. A repeat of some of those sessions will be in Thai, Bahasa, and Vietnamese as well. So watch out for them. So thank you again. Uh, hope to see, you know, uh, some of you customers up there reaching out to us as a part of what you learned so that we can help you with some of the use cases. My Twitter handle is here again. And then lastly, before we forget, don't forget to actually rate this live keynote and you'll be able to rate a lot of these sessions. You will get a USD $25 AWS credit. This is the QR code that you can scan. That's it from me from the AWS Singapore Office Studios. This is a great to be connected with you and streaming live to you. Signing off from a keynote of Summit Online ASEAN Recap. Hope you enjoy the rest of the day with our different breakout sessions coming up. Cheers, goodbye.